My name is Chuck McDonald, and I'm the Dean of Science at Carleton University. Before we start, I wish to acknowledge that the land upon which Carleton University is situated is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. On behalf of the Faculty of Science, I'd like to welcome you to this evening to our 2020 Hertzberg Lecture. The Hertzberg Lecture is hosted annually in honor of Dr. Gerhard Hertzberg, who taught and conducted research at the University of Saskatchewan and the University of Chicago before moving to the National Research Council here in Ottawa in 1948. He was widely recognized for his work in the field of atomic and molecular spectroscopy and in 1971 was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Dr. Hertzberg's connection with Carleton University included serving as the Chancellor from 1973 to 1980. Throughout his career, Dr. Hertzberg was dedicated to furthering the freedom of inquiry in science and was a strong proponent of the important and relevant role of science in society. A lecture series in his name uh, honoring him uh, exploring a science related topic of general interest seemed a fitting tribute. This year, the Hertzberg lecture is taking place a little over a month after Carleton University revealed its new strategic integrated plan. This plan emphasizes the commitment for all of us at Carleton to come together in ways that address issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. The university also recently held its second annual Inclusion Week, and in the Faculty of Science, we launched a new online series uh, of events to foster awareness, build collaborations, and spark engagement to advance EDI in science. These are just a few of the ways that we as a university are making progress, but as Carleton University President Benoit Antoine Bacon said last month, there is no question that much remains to be done. In this light, we are very fortunate this year to have as our guest lecturer, a scholar who has given talks about diversity in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines and industry uh, at international conferences, national symposia, and colleges across the US and Canada. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Maria Clave, a renowned mathematician, computer scientist, and scholar. Dr. Clave became Harvey Mudd's uh, Harvey Mudd College's fifth president in two, 2006. She is the first woman to leave the college since its founding in 1955. Prior to joining Harvey Mudd, Dr. Clave served as the Dean of Engineering and Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University. She joined Princeton from the University of British Columbia, where she had served as the Dean of Science and held various other roles from 1988 to 2002. Prior to UBC, Dr. Clave spent eight years with IBM Research in California and two years at the University of Toronto. Uh, she received her PhD and Bachelor of Science degrees in mathematics from the University of Alberta. Currently, Dr. Clave is a member of the boards of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Alliance for Southern California Innovation, uh, and the nonprofit Math for America. She is chair of the board of the nonprofit edreports.org a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a trustee for the Mathematical Science Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley. Dr. Clave has made significant research contributions in several areas of mathematics and computer science, including functional analysis, discrete mathematics, theoretical computer science, human-computer interaction, gender issues in information technology, and interactive multimedia for mathematics education. Her current research uh, focuses on discrete mathematics, and she has devoted particular attention to improving the K through 12 science and mathematics edu education in recent years. Dr. Clave has received numerous awards for her contributions to and leadership roles in these areas. She was the recipient of the 2014 Women of Vision Abbey Award for leadership and was ranked 17 on Fortune's 2014 list of the world's 50 greatest leaders. In 2015, she was honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Canadian Association of Computer Science and the Achievement Award from the American Association of University Women and was inducted into the US News STEM Solutions Leadership Hall of Fame. In 2016, Dr. Clave was honored by the Computing Research Association's Distinguished Service Award and the following year, she was the recipient of the Academic Leadership Award from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Indeed, we are both privileged and delighted that she joins us online this evening. It's my distinct pleasure to now welcome Dr. Clave as she presents the 2020 Hertzberg Lecture, Increasing Diversity in Computer Science at All Levels. Dr. Clave. So let me start by saying I'm really honored to be here. I've um, actually visited Carleton University a number of times in my career. And um, 
of course, I would much rather be here in person, but this is uh, the age of the pandemic and um, we will just make do with it as it is. And I just want to say, so first of all, I'm really thrilled to be giving this lecture. And I also just want to mention how much I enjoyed having a chance to talk to some of the students at Carleton earlier in the day. So I'm going to talk about increasing diversity in computer science. And I'll, I'll just mention that the reason I care about this is um, I'm 69 years old. And when I grew up, I was a girl who loved mathematics at a time when everyone said girls weren't good at math. And I just, that really annoyed me. And so I've spent much of my career really trying to make it clear that anyone independent of gender or religion or race or background or any of these kinds of things can be good at pretty much anything. And uh, so I'm explicitly going to be talking about increasing diversity in computer science. And all right, uh, now I have to figure out, oh, all right, I figured out how I can actually change my slides. That is good. Um, so the things I want to, I hope you will take away from this are, first of all, um, you can't attract more women and more people of color without actually doing something. But the things that you have to do are definitely doable. They're not particularly expensive or difficult. And I will particularly talk about what has happened at Harvey Mudd College uh, in the time that I've been president here. As, as a whole, we went from being 32% female in 2006, and we're now 50-50, and from being uh, a little bit more than half white in 2012, and we're now 31% Caucasian. And I will also, I will, those are the overall numbers for, for Harvey Mudd, not the numbers for computer science. The change in computer science is actually even more dramatic. And in addition to talking about what happened in computer science and what happened at our college, I will talk about how things, uh, what you can learn from this when you think about attracting more women and people of color into graduate programs and into, it says firing faculty, that's a typo. That's supposed to say hiring faculty. <sighs> so first of all, let me start by telling you a little bit about Harvey Mudd because um, I certainly, uh, when I was at the University of British Columbia, I didn't know much. I'm not even sure I'd ever heard of Harvey Mudd College at that particular time. And, um, and it's a, I think it's helpful to have a sense of the context uh, when you listen to our story. So first of all, we are a tiny science and engineering college. We have 900 undergraduate students, about 100 faculty. We have seven departments. And we're part of a consortium called the Claremont Colleges. We are about 50 kilometers east of downtown Los Angeles, uh, which actually means we're at the foot of a 10,000 foot mountain, which I had no idea existed at the time when I first came to visit. We have very, very good students. And so uh, within the US, I would just say that our, our top competitors for students are MIT, Caltech, and Stanford. If I'm talking to Canadians as I am right now, what I'd say is our students like are like the very strongest honor students at Carleton University. Uh, we're very no well known for having some particular values among our students and our faculty. For our students, we have an honor code. So we give lots of take home exams and things like that. Um, every student is expected to help every other student succeed. They love challenge, they love hard work, and they're humble, which is one of the reasons that it makes me feel like being in Canada, because I think one of the things I loved about uh, being a student and a faculty member and an academic leader in Canada is that our students have very similar, even though most universities or perhaps virtually no universities in Canada have an honor code, we certainly cherish helping others, uh, striving to meet challenges, hard work, and of course, humility. Our faculty values are 
Uh, they believe very strongly in our mission statement. Our mission statement is essentially to educate leaders in engineering, mathematics, and science who will be well, well versed in all of those areas, including as well as humanities, social sciences, and the arts, so that they are prepared to take leadership positions within their field and understand the impact of their work on society. And we were founded in 1955. One of the reasons that this particular thing about understanding the impact of your work in society is that the founding president, Joseph Platt, was one of the few physicists who refused to work on the development of atomic weapons during World War II because he felt that the impact of nuclear weapons would be bad for the world. So uh, they believe in our mission. They are very passionate about educating our students. Uh, they particularly excel in uh, innovation and teaching curriculum, research with undergraduates, and they too believe in hard work. So um, Harvey Mudd was founded as a co-ed college, but it had very few women either as faculty or students uh, in its early years. Um, even if we just look over a 20 year period from 1996 to 2016, we'll see that the faculty went from about 20% female to about 40% female, which is where it is today. And students went from about 20% female to about 50%, which again is where it is today. So racial diversity. Uh, I'm giving you uh, the numbers from the academic year 2012, uh, 13 to 2019, 20. So you'll see we went from 54% Caucasian to uh, a little bit less than 31% from African-American from less than 1% to just over 4%. Uh, Asian, 20%, fairly stable. Latinx uh, from 7% to 20%. And uh, perhaps the, the more interesting one is two or more races from uh, about 2.5% to over 10%. Um, this is fairly dramatic. And the one thing I would say is it's, uh, in terms of changing uh, the makeup of students and faculty, uh, it's a lot easier to do it with respect to gender than with respect to race for all kinds of reasons. Now, in terms of the increase in racial diversity in our faculty, that takes a lot longer. And I often sort of joke by saying, um, students stay for roughly four years, faculty stay for 35 years. And so the rate of turnover is a lot slower. But when you actually pay attention to it, you can make fairly steady pro progress. But the moment you stop paying attention, it disappears. And probably the most important thing of all, and I'll speak a little bit more about this later, is to, import, is to educate the search committees for faculty members because it is so easy for us to hire people who look like us. And unless you're really conscious about taking steps to avoid that, that is what will usually happen. So um, Harvey Mudd has been through a huge amount of change. And uh, when I actually first arrived here, there was not a lot of support for diversity and inclusion. And a lot of that was that Harvey Mudd felt that it was merit-based institution and that the only reason that we didn't have more people of color and more women was that those people weren't that interested in STEM. And we, I had, the, I think the main thing the college was looking for when they recruited me was they wanted somebody who would lead a strategic planning exercise. And I had led a strategic planning exercise at Princeton University for the School of Engineering that had been highly successful. And, uh, and so I was recruited to MUD to do that. And we spent my first nine months here from uh, summer of 2006 through uh, February of 2007 doing strategic planning. It was highly inclusive. We invited all of our students, faculty, staff, parents, and trustees, alumni to particip participate. And 
uh, we had over a third of our students participating, all of our faculty, uh, a good all of our board members, and a good number of parents and alumni as well. And out of that strategic planning exercise came six themes, and one of those was unsurpassed excellence and diversity at all levels. Now, you might sort of wonder how, just through a strategic planning exercise, we suddenly spurred all this interest in diversity and inclusion. And the truth is, uh, we had four strategic planning workshops, and each one they all happened in the same week in October. Each one had a keynote speaker. And I was very lucky that I was able to persuade Freeman Hrabowski, who is the president at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and the first African-American scientist to be president of a research university. He was the keynote speaker for the third workshop. <coughs> and I will just say, before he gave his talk, we were still on this well, you can't be a merit-based institution and have real diversity. And after that, all of a sudden, everyone says, yeah, of course you could maintain excellence and have diversity. And that's where the unsurpassed excellence and diversity at all levels came from. And this particular photograph is just a picture of uh, several of our faculty members, as well as uh, uh, students and trustees uh, voting with colored dots on what they wanted to talk about in the afternoon. So I would say most of our faculty and staff were on board after the strategic planning. It took a little bit longer to get broad based support for our students, our trustees and our alumni. And the other thing that really helped was we did diversity and inclusion programming for absolutely everyone. And um, that took time, but it made a huge difference. So um, I'm gonna talk first of all about the kinds of things we changed throughout our community. So first of all, uh, we absolutely every brochure, the website, and anything that shows people, we make sure that we display a diverse community. In our curriculum and pedagogy, one of the things we I learned uh, partly through our own work, but partly through studying what had been done at other institutions, is that you're more likely to attract women and people of color into disciplines if in your introductory courses, in addition to the theoretical underpinnings, you include applications and show how the theory that you're introducing actually can be used to serve to solve real world problems. And then of course, we worked really hard to remove unintentional privilege and bias. And just to give you a sense of what that is, if you've ever been in an introductory course where there's a wide range of preparation, you'll notice that there's a small number of students who use up most of the airtime asking questions and answering questions. And we just remove that by talking to those students and saying, we love having you in this course. We love your passion for the subject. We're sure you are not aware of the fact that some students find the fact you are know so much intimidating. And so if we could just have conversations about the things that interest you during office hours instead of in class time, it would be really helpful. And not surprisingly, none of those students were trying to be intimidating. And so they um, are willing to use up less of the airtime. We also have found for similar reasons that giving our students access to early internships and research opportunities, so as early as the summer after their first year, is very effective in attracting and retaining women and people of color in areas where they're underrepresented like computer science and engineering. It's important for them to have access to diverse role models, so if you don't have a lot of women or people of color on your faculty, it's really great to bring in outside speakers. As I mentioned, education of faculty search committees is really important. I'll say more about that later. Co-curricular activities is really important. And one of the things we had to do, so since, uh, you know, if you think about who serves on your board, so we're a private college, we have, I believe it's 43 trustees. Uh, half of the funding that we bring in each year, I mean, 
half of the gifts that we're bringing each year uh, come from trustees. And so typically uh, the board of a private college is almost entirely alumni. And if like us, you were largely white and male during your early years, if you do that, your board is gonna be largely white and male because typically people have to be, uh, in order to have the financial capacity to make significant gifts, which is expected for serving on a board, um, they have to have been financially successful. And usually it will be people who graduated, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. So we changed our board composition to be 50% alumni, but of that, uh, probably about uh, 10 to 15% are actually young, younger alumni. So we can have more diversity from that. 20% are parents, either current parents or former parents. That allows us to add diversity. And 30% are other, which means they're people who are absolutely passionate about the college. Almost always they're passionate about our success in diversifying. We have become from a not very diverse co college. We're now a role model for other colleges across the country in terms of both uh, women and racial diversity. And so the 30% other are pe people who are passionate about diversity and in general are quite diverse themselves. So now let me talk about computer science. Um, uh, if the computer science department had started worrying about the fact they had so few women in the major the year before I arrived, and they were graduating typically 25 to 30 majors a year, and of those two or three would be female. And, and so they had decided to look at what had been done at other institutions. Now the two first institutions that started working on attracting more women to computer science were the University of British Columbia, uh, where I led that effort, and Carnegie Mellon University in the US. And uh, one of the things that both of those institutions did was change its introductory course to be more, be more attractive to women and in particular, adding applications in addition to theory. Um, they also made an effort to recruit many more female faculty. And during uh, the, the time I'd been there, they have gone from being a third female to half female. Uh, they've also worked hard on racial diversity. And so we've seen white students go from 75% to 27%, Asian roughly double from 10 to 19, Hispanic uh, a multiple of nine times from 2% to 18%, and Black an infinite increase from zero to 4%. And uh, in terms of faculty of color, they have gone from having none in 2006 to now having three out of 18. So what did they actually do to make this happen? The first thing is they changed the introductory course and then they changed other courses. And I'll say more about this on the next slide. They eliminated what uh, they called student macho behavior. And essentially that was what I was talking about a few minutes ago when I talked about students who talk a lot in class. And in a computer science class, those tend to be largely white and Asian males. They started taking our first year female students to the Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing. Um, the first year they took 15 students, then by three or four years later, they were taking uh, on the order of 50 or 60 students, not all first years. Um, and more recently they have uh, made the transition to instead, now that we're 50% of our students and faculty in computer science are female, they're really focusing on students of color. So they're taking them to the Tapia celebration, which is a, a, a conference uh, for uh, people of color and people with disabilities in computer science. And the, the main reason for taking students to these conferences is because it exposes them to role models. They provided uh, summer research experiences between the first and the second year. And um, I also worked closely with the major tech companies to, to encourage them, and they did do this, to start early internship programs so that, um, so Google, Microsoft, Facebook, 
uh, Intel, LinkedIn, all established early internship programs where they very deliberately try to focus on recruiting women and students of color because we know that if we can give those students those early experiences, they're more likely to stay in the major and graduate. And they also recruited more faculty of color and women. Now, changing the intro course. So what's important about this, there's the fact that they changed it, but there's also the fact that they changed the way they talked about it. And both are important. So the old course everyone talked about as learning to program in Java. Now, of course, it wasn't about learning to program in Java. It was about fundamental concepts in computer science, but everyone talked about it as learning to program in Java. So the new co course is, we talk about it as team-based creative problem solving in science and engineering using computational approaches in Python. Now, all of those, uh, <laughs> all of the words in this phrase are really important. So first of all, it's team-based. It's not, so we use pair programming. Uh, it's not something you do by yourself. It's something you do. It's a social activity with another human being. Creative is impre incredibly important because uh, virtually every young person I know wants to be seen as creative. Problem solving is natural because we're a STEM college and everybody in STEM solves problems. That's also why the applications are in science and engineering. Now, computer science has to come in someplace and that's the computational approaches. Now, Python and Java are both very popular programming languages in industry. The difference is that Python is much more forgiving. So it, one of the things we want to use is a language that will allow our students to get those internships after their first year. And so it was important to use a language that was frequently used in industry, but also to use one that has much more a much more forgiving approach to syntax. Now, one of the things that is unfortunate is that in many places, when you take your first computer science course, you will have a huge variety of prior experience. You will have people like my son who started programming when he was 12 and, you know, had essentially read through several computer science textbooks by the time he took his first university computer science course. Then you will have what makes up the majority of our students are people who've never written a line of code or had a computer science class in, in their experience. And so we have to find some way why, why how we can have each of those Everyone in that range of prior experience have a great experience, but not discourage the people with no experience. So what we do, the intro course is called CS5, and we divide that into two sections. There's CS5 Gold, that's for people with no prior experience, and CS5 Black is for students who've had perhaps one course in high school, an AP computer science class, for example. Now we teach them at the same time so that if a student starts in gold and feels that they know enough that they can shift to black, they can do that within the first couple of weeks and vice versa. Then we have those students like my son who'd been programming since an early age. And we put them all in a course called CS42, uh, which is the combination of uh, this, well, the material that's in CS5 and the material that's in the second course in the sequence CS60. Now you might, uh, one of the goals of doing this is that we want the students, whether they went through CS5 Gold or CS5 Black to be equally well prepared for the next course in the sequence, namely CS60. And you might say, well, how could you possibly do that given that the ones going to CS5 Black have, you know, a year's extra experience? And uh, the answer is as follows. Um, it will take us about half as much time to teach the, the students in CS5 Black the material in CS5. So we fill in all the rest of the time with the really interesting, challenging topics 
that will not be useful in the next two courses in the sequence, CS60 and CS70. Because what we want to make sure is we keep them interested. We're teaching them things that are useful, but they won't be useful for the next two semesters. And in that way, it gives the people from CS5 Gold, they have the same preparation when they go into 60 and 70 and are as likely to become CS majors. Now, the elimination of macho behavior, I essentially already told you about, we just have um, nice conversations with the students who are talking too much. And that seems to work fine. So the outcomes, first of all, uh, these courses are incredibly popular, not just at Harvey Mudd. So because we're part of the Claremont Colleges, the students from uh, the other Claremont Colleges can take these courses. They never used to take the courses, but now we teach roughly 600 students CS5 Gold, and of those, probably 100 are from Harvey Mudd and 500 are from the other colleges. Um, we have many more majors. Uh, we now, uh, this last year, we graduated out of uh, 204 graduates in the class of 2020, 106 were CS majors. Now, you know, part of this is, is not what we did here, part of it is just there's so much demand for CS degrees in industry that many, many more people are taking these courses uh, and majoring. But it's also the case that our, the people who are majoring in other areas like engineering or physics, chemistry, biology, math, many of them are taking the higher level CS classes because they're really enjoyable and really useful. So this slide, bumps are normal. This is a slide from a protest in the spring in 2017. And the reason I, I, I put this in the talk is because when you change your student body, radically change your student body over eight years, there are all kinds of things that you discover in your culture that are obnoxious to people of color and to women that nobody had ever claimed, uh, complained about before. And, and so, yes, we had protests. Yes, it was very uncomfortable, um, but it seemed to have been a very important part in shifting our entire community towards really focusing on diversity and inclusion. I think we had been focusing a lot on diversity, but less on inclusion. And so uh, I think we all look back at spring of 2017 uh, as just a painful time, but as something that was actually a very useful learning experience. So insight for graduate programs. So one thing we know for sure is uh, chances to do undergraduate research increase interest in graduate school. And so if you are interested in increasing the number of women and people of color in graduate programs, it really helps to offer undergraduate research experiences to students, both from your own university, but from universities across the, the country. Uh, it also really helps to um, make it clear that the kinds of people you're looking for are people who are creative, who know how to work on teams well, and can, can communicate well, as well as their technical skills and knowledge. Now, everyone knows that the quote unquote soft skills like creativity, collaboration and communication are really important. But most of the time when we talk about the kind of people we're looking for, we don't stress these. And particularly for women and people of color, it's like this is code for we are inclusive. The interview process, it's really important that when you have, you know, graduate, uh, you host grad, prospective graduate students, you give them a chance to meet diverse students and faculty. And it's also important to train the people who are serving as your hosts, whether they're students or faculty or staff, on diversity and inclusion. Because there are so many things that people 
mistakes that people will make completely unintentionally and they won't make if you've actually had an opportunity to educate them. Um, I think it's once you actually have a, a more diverse community, it's really important to build confidence, confidence and community among those diverse groups and taking, uh, taking them to conferences, having diverse uh, speakers, um, all, just giving them exposure to diverse role models is really important. And then the final one is demystify the path to success. So if you are a member of the dominant group or a dominant group as an undergraduate student or as a graduate student or as a faculty member, you will have access to social occasions where you learn about what it takes to get tenure, what it takes to get through your qualifying exams, what it takes to get through your candidacy, all of these kinds of things that happen automatically. And if you're not a member of a dominant group, the chances are that just won't happen for you. So it's really helpful if you host workshops that just spell out all of those kinds of things. So, now we're talking about recruiting faculty. Uh, I've already said how important it is to educate search committees on avoiding bias, how to attract diverse candidates to apply for the position, how to interview diverse candidates successful, successfully. And you know, there's a, a great story from MIT where uh, they uh, one of the things they often do is when they're uh, at recruiting faculty for a faculty position, they will, uh, people in the department will reach out to their colleagues at other top departments to ask them to suggest people. And it turns out that if you just ask the question, can you suggest, you know, people who you think are really promising who are going to graduate this year, overwhelmingly, it will be white and Asian males. But if you say, can you suggest people, and we're particularly interested in women and people of color, as well as Asian and white males, all of a sudden they will think of women and people of color that they can actually suggest. And there are just so many, this is not because the people who are asking or the people who are suggesting candidates are trying to focus on white and Asian males. It's just, we live in a society that has lots of stereotypes and even when we're trying to be very careful to avoid bias, it's easy for it to be part of the process or to enter the process. One of the things we've also found very successful is we always ask our candidates to provide statements on their philosophy on teaching and their philosophy on research. Well, we also ask them to provide a separate statement on their approach to diversity and inclusion. First of all, uh, just the fact that you asked for that makes it clear to candidates that this is a place that really cares about diversity and inclusion. And so for diverse candidates, they're more likely, or, or for other candidates who care a lot about diversity and inclusion, the fact that you included that makes it much more likely that uh, you will both recruit diverse candidates and you will recruit other non-diverse candidates who are passionate about diversity and inclusion. And then, of course, always ensure candidates meet with diverse groups of students, faculty, and also diversity leaders at your institution. I cannot tell you how many times I have spoken with somebody who went on an interview who is female or a person of, count, of color to say, um, well, they only met one other woman or they only met one other person of color. And the best way that people can tell that your institution is a place that cares about diversity and inclusion is to talk to underrepresented members of underrepresented groups and hear their story of what their experience is like. And uh, this, uh, we're now open for Q&A, but I just wanted to show you this particular picture. This is from our new student orientation. But of course it wasn't this fall because this fall nobody is going on uh, to theme parks and on various kinds of rides. Uh, but it does give you a sense of how happy our students were to be first year students at MUD. OK, 
Hey, uh, great, Dr. Claude. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, the questions have been sent in, and I, I can read uh, to you uh, some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, the, the first one is, is computer science uh, introduced in schools early enough? I believe in the UK they are introduced to introducing early, and do you believe this has been a part of the problem we see today? Well, I'll just say that the UK has the worst statistics for women, way worse statistics for women in computer science than Canada or the US. Canada and the US are roughly between 15 and 20% female and UK, not so. So uh, it's probably be less than 10% in most UK universities. So I don't think the time that you introduce, I mean, I. I do think it's great to have access to computer science um, in middle school and in, in high school, but only if it's taught in a way that's really inclusive. And if if in your school there are only two women out of thirty in you know your computer science class, that's probably worse than not having a computer science class at all. Okay. Um... Uh, I guess uh, somewhat along those lines, there's a question that asked: uh, Are the percentage that you, the percentages you were talking about for the whole college, or just for computer science? I think you had both. But the, the, so the fifty-fifty for male-female is both for computer science and for the whole college, and it also holds for physics and engineering, which are two other areas where women tend to be underrepresented. In terms of racial diversity, um, I gave you both the whole college and I think I also gave you computer science as well, but I would say it's, it's also reflected in, in physics and engineering um, as well as in the other departments. So I, I think we've been pretty successful. Computer science was first, but one of the things that happened was in terms of really focusing on women, after the number of women went up in computer science, women started going into physics and engineering and say, why aren't you supporting us as well? And of course, they ended up supporting them. Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, the next question is, uh, could you please provide examples of co-curricular programs? Um, I, I think things like SWE, uh, Society of Women Engineers, uh, Women in Computer Science chapters. And it doesn't, I mean, uh, in, in both SWE and in our ACM chapter for Women in Computer Science, we have men as well as women. So it's not that it's restricted to women, but these are activities that organize things like inviting speakers, trips to conferences, all kinds of things that are, are really aimed at uh, they organize hackathons. I mean, just lots and lots of different kinds of activities to create a sense of uh, support for women in computer science and people of color in computer science. Great, thanks. Um, you, you spoke a little bit about it, but uh, so several people have asked uh, about um, techniques to eliminate student macho behavior and oh, how that's okay. worked. <laughs> yes, okay. So uh, one is to um, divide up uh, intro courses according to preparation. And um, I really think that um, that makes a huge difference. But even within courses that are, that have, um, uh, you know, roughly equal preparation for most of the students in the course, um, you will still see both in lectures and in um, you know, tutorials or labs, et cetera, that you will, you will certainly see some difference in behavior. And I think the, the best thing to do is to train, I mean, if you're teaching a class with um, 100 or fewer students, then you yourself as the faculty member can just have a nice, encouraging conversation with students who are talking too much, and that works fine. If you're teaching a class with 600 people in it, then it's probably better to have the TAs because you've probably got a, a larger number. And also you wanna make sure that, um, you, you know, in your tutorials or lab sections that it's not happening there. And the whole idea with this conversation, so I'm gonna pretend I'm doing it with you, Chuck. Okay. <laughs> okay, because that's the easiest way to do it. And if I were here in person, I would have some male computer science faculty come up so that I could do it with them. But I know you're a chemist, but I'll treat you like a computer <laughs> for now. Uh, I'm sure you use computational approaches in your case. Yes. 
Yes, we do. <laughs> um, so, um, Chuck, I, so I'm pretending that I am the instructor in the intro course, and you are one of the students in my class who's asking a lot of questions and who's answering a lot of questions. Chuck, I absolutely love having you as a student in my class. You are so passionate about computer science, and I just love the fact that you have tons of questions and that you, you also have lots of ideas for answers. So thank you so much for being part of my class. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's the, the obvious answer. And I go, um, Chuck, you know, um, I would love to meet with you uh, in office hours um, and have these conversations because I don't want to lose those conversations. But I'm sure you don't realize this, but because you ask such great questions and have such great answers, there are lots of students in, in our class who are, they just think they don't know nearly as much as you. And so they're reluctant to ask questions and answer questions. So I'd really like it if you could sort of, you know, ask at most one question per class and answer at most one question per class, but then we'll have this in office hours, we can talk about all kinds of things. Would that be okay with you? That would be excellent. Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's just like you're trying to make the person feel valued and special, which they are, but you're also just trying to very politely introduce this idea of intimidation. And, you know, I will just say that when I was an undergraduate in math classes, I wanted to ask and answer every question. And nobody ever suggested that I not do it. But if somebody had said this to me, I really would have moderated it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, okay, so I am the person asking questions, though, so <laughs> for this. <laughs> uh, so uh, the next question is, uh, do you see any change in attrition for women in 2006 versus now? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, well, now it's just normal to be female and be in computer science or physics or engineering. And so there's, yeah, like we, we, see, we see much better retention in those majors because even if you were, I mean, one of the things we've seen, and there's lots of data on this, is that if you are a, a female uh, majoring in computer science, and uh, maybe 20% or fewer of the, your classmates are female. The first time you get a B plus, you decide to switch to another major. Whereas you have all of these males in the class who are getting Cs and thinking they're rocking it. So <coughs> the, the issue has been that when there's a small percentage of women they have to be doing incredibly well to stick with it. But when there's lots of women, you could get that B or even a C plus and not leave. Oh, that makes sense. <coughs> um, so the next question is, uh, when you mentioned it was a bit harder to convince students and alumni, are there any useful techniques for getting through to people who might be less convinced that diversity is important uh, and won't uh, discredit merit? Yeah. Um, so I, I think one of the things that's really interesting for me is that initially alumni really felt we were going to destroy the quality of the college. And now we probably have a handful of older alumni that feel that way. And we have the vast majority of alumni who are so proud of what the college has done. And it's just very interesting to see that change. And I think one of the things that's playing into that is Harvey Mudd is a really great place. I mean, it really has phenomenal teaching, phenomenal students, a phenomenal culture, but it's not very well known. And so I think one of the things that really helped is that our efforts along diversity and inclusion, all of a sudden, you know, we're were really well known. And, you know, one of the other things that happened is because of diversity and inclusion successes, <coughs> all of the top tech companies were now one of their top places to recruit. Now, when we weren't nearly as well known, 
that wasn't as much the case. But now they're hiring lots of white and Asian males as well as women and people of color. And they're finding out that our, our graduates are absolutely fantastic. So I, I think that the reality of the fact that all of a sudden Harvey Mudd is so much better known and so much more appreciated actually helped a lot. Oh, that makes it, sense. Yeah, the other part is diversity inclusion programming. And, you know, we have done it, um, we have done it with our students, we've done it with our faculty, we've done it with our board. Um, we have done it more subtly with our alumni um, by sort of having uh, parts of alumni weekend and alumni programming address these issues. Um, but, you know, I think the, the reality is that our students, our graduates, so we're cur currently ranked number one in the US uh, for mid-career earnings. Um, number two is MIT, number three is the US Naval Academy, number four is Princeton. And the gap is $4,000 between each adjacent pair. So there's $12,000 difference between us and Princeton. That's pretty impressive. Uh, we're also ranked number one, two, or three for early career earnings. And so it's been very clear that becoming more diverse has not in any way diluted the success of our graduates. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, I certainly do have, I know at least one alum whose class of I think it's 66 or something like that, who's still really mad at us about this. And there's probably another five or six, but it's really rare now. Oh, that's good. Um, sort of along those lines, uh, there's a question. Did you have to, uh, and how did you manage instructors who were not so open to changes in introductory courses in the way you mentioned? Um, you know, uh, it, had to, it had to come from the department itself. Like, I think having the president say, I mean, the person who was chair of the computer science department when I arrived uh, dropped by my office about a year ago. He's now retired. His name is Mike Erlinger. And he said, he put his head in and he said, you know, Maria, you were incredibly smart about keeping your nose out of what we were doing around diversity and inclusion. And he said, we knew that you knew a lot about this, but we needed to own it. And that's, so what we have done is make diversity and inclusion programming available to every department, uh, to every student group, all of those kinds of things, but we're not shoving it down their throats because the worst possible thing, I mean, presidents have influence. They can uh, make things happen like a strategic planning exercise, which I know Carlton has just completed, but they can't actually tell a faculty member to do anything. Or they could tell them and it would make the faculty member do the opposite thing. So, um, so we have really focused on allowing departments to decide that they wanted to change their intro course. No, I think that's good. The next question is, can you speak a bit more uh, about the learning around investing in diversity, but not, uh, but being not as invested in inclusivity? Oh, well, I think, um, so one of the things that's fortunate about being at MUD is we were created to be a place that is innovative in science and engineering education. That was, you know, the reason for starting Harvard MUD. And um, I think there are many institutions, including some very well-known ones. And you know, it's I did spend some time at a very well-known university in the U.S. And um, they can be very effective at uh, recruiting diverse student bodies but much less effective at realizing that they need to change so that those students get as supportive and engaging an experience as their more traditional students. And 
um, I, I will just say that it is, it is pretty common for universities, and this includes Harvey Met College, that we didn't understand what we need to change until we actually had a more diverse population present. And then the really important thing was to understand that when people said, you know, um, all of the people giving seminars in this particular department are old white males, for that department to be able to understand that that's not appropriate. And it wasn't that the department was against having a more diverse set of speakers. It's that they were just, they, they were inviting the friends of the person who was organizing the seminar series. And that happened to be, now old, of course, in our students' view is probably 35 and up, <laughs> not my age, but still. And so I, I think one of the things that's been super important is to be able to say, yeah, we're willing to listen when people have things that they think we should change. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what would you say was the greatest barrier to bringing about these changes at your institution? Oh. Well, I, you know, I, th I think what I would say is that, so I said something about, um, the uh, spring 2017 when we had the protest was really important. Well, uh, we had a couple of departments not to be named that thought, who explicitly would say, you're lowering the standards by doing this. And they would go to the, our vice president for admission and say, you know, we used to get great students and now we don't. And I would say that particular department was uh, the department chair particularly wanted students who had, and this is uh, that, that individual's term, uh, intellectual firepower. And what that meant is that it was somebody who could enter a sort of an adversarial discussion about a concept and hold their own. Now, uh, there are lots of people who have lots of intellectual power who don't like that kind of exchange. And I would say there are lots of women and lots of people of color who would not find that a particularly appealing thing to take part in. And what happened was that we had a, um, a committee from uh, an, another college come and interview students and faculty on issues around sort of students of color on issues about whether they were feeling included and valued and also interviewed s some of the faculty who were feeling like the standards had been lowered. And the report when it came back from the review team was considered sufficiently upsetting by uh, the faculty who received it, that it was not shared widely with the students. Somebody leaked it to the students and that's what caused the protests. And I think that it was very interesting in that that was incredibly painful for, for everybody involved, for the students of color, for the faculty from that particular department. Uh, but as a result, we went through all kinds of difficult conversations about these different perspectives on what, on what people's experiences were and it moved the whole college forward. So, you know, and, you know, also part of one of the things that happened that particular spring was that a beloved Lat Latinx student was discovered dead in his dorm room. Now it turned out it was an opioid overdose, but 
it was suspected that it was a suicide that had been committed because he didn't feel welcomed. And he was a major in the particular department that was involved in this conversation. Now, none of that was true, but a couple of weeks later, there was a student suicide at Scripps College, which is the women's college across the street from us. And it, it was a black student in this case, and she wrote a suicide note, and it was very clear that she was very angry at the college. And so Willie's death, who was our student, was just automatically assumed to be a similar suicide. And, you know, the machine that did, that analyzed the, you know, the, the, blood test from was out of service for four months in Los Angeles County. So it took four months for us to get the result. And so that was also playing a big role in those protests. But, you know, I would say it was very painful, but in some sense, it was important to go through that because people had to be willing to actually talk about the about the different perspectives and how a number of students of color in that department were feeling like they were not treated respectfully and a number of female students. So, and I think that particular department has come a long way since then. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, do you find that being a white woman has helped or hindered your ability to focus on racial diversity as well as gender diversity? Uh, what are some ways that white women can help improve diversity in, in computer science? So um, it certainly helps with gender diversity. I'm the first woman in my role for the last 32 years. So um, I, I think that makes me a highly credible uh, person on the topic of gender diversity. I think in terms of racial diversity, um, the, the reality is that we've had sufficient success, I mean, not only success, because we've had problems and obstacles and barriers as well, but I think I would say that our faculty and, um, and students would genuinely believe that our college is committed to diversity and inclusion with respect to race as well. And I, I, I mean, I'm not living my life as a black woman. That would be way more challenging in the U.S. Um, I, I mean, or even as a Hispanic woman, it would be way more challenging. So there's no question that because I am white, I have a level of privilege that a, woman, a person of color wouldn't. But I, I think in the end, actions are what really counts. And we've come a long way. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, another question um, sort of related is, uh, what would you suggest uh, in terms of interviewing potential faculty if your department is 100% white? Um, so if you're, I'm assuming your department faculty is 100% white. I think that's what, yeah, I think that's what the. Uh, so first of all, um, if there are faculty of color in other parts of the university, which I'm sure there are, you want to make sure that you, first of all, invite one of those people to be on your search committee. Because there's nothing that says that you can't, and we generally have somebody from another department on every search committee. And that's also something that we tended to do at both Princeton and at, um, at UBC as well as a way of, of trying to just bring a different perspective in. So that's one thing. The second thing is to have them, I'm sure that uh, uh, you have somebody who um, is uh, handles diversity and inclusion, EDI matters at Carleton, probably in the Faculty of Science as well, have them meet with that person. And then make sure that the student groups also are, are diverse. Oh, that makes sense. Um... The next question is, how do you avoid the white uh, or Asian young men feeling that they're being discriminated against, discriminated against when you create special opportunities such as early research for underrepresented students? Oh, we don't create special opportunities just for underrepresented students. We create opportunities for all students. But I'll say, you know, uh, 
I, this is a few years ago, uh, I was talking about, um, you know, how much progress we've made in terms of representation of people of color and women at the college. And one of my white male board members said, would a, would a white or male, would a white male or Asian male student actually want to come to Harvey Mudd right now, given the way you're biasing it against them? And my response was, and it's true, the vast majority of white and Asian males who choose to come to Harvey Mudd actually choose to come because it's so diverse, because they want to be part of a diverse community, because they know that when they function in the world, they're going to be more effective if they have excellent communication, teamwork, uh, et cetera, experiences with a more diverse community. So I think it has made our community much more attractive to white and Asian males as students and as faculty um, because we have this focus. I think so. I think that's great. Um, the next question is, when do you think we might be able to relax the uh, constant vigilance, uh, not uh, drop uh, efforts at inclusion and diversity, but relax the level of effort a bit? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know, 100 years maybe? <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, uh, it's just like, I just noticed. So here we are at MUD, we've done all of this work. One year, the person who's our provost equivalent didn't meet with search committees um, to you know talk about who they were gonna bring in. And that was the year that five out of the six faculty that got hired were white males. Yeah. It just, I, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but we live in a society that has stereotypes and we've all grown up in it. And I think, you know, to be honest, Canada, as far as race goes, is a way better place to be a person of color than the US um, for all kinds of reasons. But it's still true that if you're an Aboriginal, a First Nations person in Canada, it's not not a great place to grow up. So, you know, I think, uh, I, I think that the long-term solution is we just, we need to work on it for a long time because it takes a long time for this stuff to fade away. Yeah. Um, sort of along those lines, uh, one of the attendees uh, thanks you for s such a wonderful talk and asks, can you share some insight on the best ways of educating search committees? Oh, um, yeah, so uh, I, I'll describe a couple of ways. So um, uh, I'll tell you what we did at Princeton, and what we did at Harvey Mudd. So at Princeton, what um, this was the work uh, led by uh, an associate dean from electrical engineering, Martin, uh, Margaret Martinosi, who's currently at the National Science Foundation um, as the director of computing and information sciences and engineering. But anyhow, Margaret basically uh, recruited one person from each of the six departments in the School of Engineering at Princeton who was passionate about diversity and inclusion. And together, they put together a stack about this high of um, reports that had been written on how to educate search committees. Now, um, the best, the most of those were came from NSF had a, a things called advanced grants, which went to groups of universities to work on diversifying their faculty. And so there's lots out there on best practices for search committees. So anyway, they got the stack, they read it, and then they agreed that what would happen was that every search committee in every department would have a visit from two of the people on that group, so that was a group of seven people in total, who were not from their department because it's this idea that the outsider is more effective. And so they would come and, you know, they synthesized a, a, a best practices list of what you should do and would go through it with them. Um, at Harvey Mudd, what we have done is um, we have used, there are two associate deans for diversity. One is on the student side and one is on the faculty side. 
And generally what we have done is have each search committee meet with that pair of, of deans. And again, they will walk them through best practices. So, you know, there's, there's lots of information out there, but um, I think the important things is to, you know, have an impressive set of sources where it came from, yeah. right? Because listen to outsiders and then have people from outside the department who are basically working with the search committee to go through this kind of material with them. Now, uh, does this always work? No. We had one search go completely sideways on us because uh, the group was so successful that they convinced the department that they should only interview people of color. And they ended up with the people they were set to invite to come and interview. None of them were qualified to actually be a faculty member at MUD. It just, and you know, I know that department's a fantastic department. All of my departments are fantastic. Uh, the people on the search committee were, uh, it just fell off a cliff somehow. And I, it, so, so there's some level of balance needed. Um, so I have one more question uh, and then we have to wind up. There's, there's been a tremendous amount of interest um, uh, in questions and uh, from and a really good po positive feedback from the audience. Um, one uh, comment is uh, great suggestions on diversifying the student body. Can you talk a bit more about the changes in curriculum and pedagogy beyond course descriptions and computing languages offered that assisted in attracting more diverse student body? Um, yeah, so I think a lot of it uh, really has, so let me give a completely different example from engineering instead of computer science. So the core engineering course has to be taught by, taken by every student at MUD, whether they're gonna major in engineering or not. So mathematical transforms course, it was Fourier transforms, it's now Laplace transforms. It was hated and it was taught as a lecture course and there was no motivation given for why you should be learning Fourier transference. So based on what the CS course had done, the engineering department decided to do the following. First of all, they made it a flipped course. So uh, each student has to watch a 15 minute video on Sunday evening. On, in, the, in the Monday class and the Wednesday class, the Monday class, each student writes an individual quiz and then they write a team quiz. The individual quiz is so that you really encourage the students to watch the video. The team-based quiz is so that they actually teach each other the material. And then they do team-based problem solving uh, based on the concept they're dealing with that week for the rest of the Monday class and for all of the Wednesday class. On Thursday and Friday, they take a two-hour practicum and what they're doing is they are building an underwater sub or underwater robot that will demonstrate every single concept on the mathematical transforms that they have learned. So the whole idea is one, it's team-based. Two, it's you are seeing you're working on both mathematical problems, but you're also working on problems with something tangible that can show you how that applies in real life. And that's essentially exactly what has been done in the other courses as well. Um, add in teamwork and add in an application area where you can understand why the theoretical concept you're learning matters. Oh, great. Uh, so I think we'll have to cut off the questions here now. Uh, uh, I really, really like to thank you uh, for this talk. Um, and I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Ayusha. Uh, she's the chair of the Women in Computer Science to deliver a special thank you to you. Thank you, Chuck. Hi, Ayusha. Hello. Hello, Dr. Maria. Hello again. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Thank you so much for being here with us on behalf of the computer science students at Carleton. We're really grateful for you to share your experience and expertise. There's a lot of work um, that still needs to be done to achieve gender parity in tech, but the work you've done so far is a huge step and is in the right step. And on behalf of all the women in Carleton, we are so excited to implement um, some of your lessons in making the environment more inclusive and um, less intimidating for future women in tech. As student leaders, I believe that we have so much to offer in terms of providing support and opportunities that makes minority experience in universities so much better and um, so much less stressful. And during our like student meet and greet, you, you gave us some tips on how we could do so. You stress on the act of how collaboration between faculty leaders and student government leaders could make a huge impact on diversity in this field. And the tips that you've given us in terms of like creating peer mentor groups, of eliminating macho student stereotypes, which I'm pretty sure everybody has come across and increasing TA diversity is something like I and my fellow um, executive members in CCSS, um, Technolab and Riggs would definitely work on. So once again, thank you so much for being here with us. And as somebody who's really passionate about inclusion, I think this experience and this lecture has been so much helpful for not only me, but like entire department. Thanks Ayusha. It has been so much fun being with you. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to spend time uh, with everyone at Carleton University. And I wish you the very best. Um, and I know you have my email address, so you can always re reach out and ask questions if you want. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, that this uh, brings to a conclusion our uh, Hertzberg lecture for this year. Thank you so much, Dr. Clave. Uh, we definitely hope to see you again uh, sometime when you're able to actually come to Ottawa. It would be great to ha have you here and to host you uh, here in person. Yeah, I would love to do that. And so thank you for having me. And I loved our conversation today. Um, it's a privilege to spend time with you guys. Bye. Good night. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone.